Credit ratings agency Moody's downgrades the Bahamas to junk territory. The commissioner of police weighs in on how police-involved shootings are handled. Plus, graduation season continues. Welcome to Our News and thank you for joining us. I'm Kyle Joachim. Credit ratings agency Moody's has downgraded the Bahamas' ratings by two notches into junk status territory. While maintaining that the move should not cause a panic, financial expert Gowan Bo said the government must begin to take steps to reassure investors. Jillian Gray has more. After yet another downgrade from an international credit rating agency, financial expert Gowan Bo said the government must come up with legislation in order to repay debt. He added that the current budget communication fell short. It was about patting on the back for the things we've done. It was about criticism of the things that weren't done or the things that weren't done by previous administrations, etc. And what we have to bear in mind is all of that is water under the bridge and history that the persons who you really needed to be speaking to were the persons who you would ultimately be borrowing from. And the budget debate fell way short of that. Credit ratings agency Moody's has downgraded the Bahamas' ratings by two notches into junk status and changed the country's economic outlook to negative. According to Moody's, the action was taken because of the economic shock caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Bo said the theatrics of Parliament spoke more to the constituents in the 2020-2021 budget debate rather than to investors, adding that neither the government nor the opposition gave a real plan as to how the Bahamas should go about repaying its debt. He said developing a plan is more critical now than ever before. The rating agencies will say they've heard many promises by many administrations and they've not had the written plans that they can hold the governments accountable to. And so when they come to measure us, they are looking for the actions that have actually been taken. The Ministry of Finance has predicted a contraction in GDP of 12 percent. However, Moody's has predicted that figure to be as high as 20 percent. Responding to the downgrade, the Ministry of Finance said it was not surprised as the coronavirus exacerbated fiscal challenges. Bo said while the downgrade shouldn't be dismissed, it should not cause a panic as several other countries saw downgrades as well. The rest of the world will be going through this and the rest of the world will be getting credit ratings that are downgraded. There are um, several OECD countries that are seeing their credit ratings downgraded. We just happen to be on the cusp of investment grade and non-investment grade. In this game, it's about business, and we're dealing with investors and lenders. We're not dealing with family members who we're hoping to borrow from and hoping they forget and don't pay it back. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. While well, PLP Deputy Leader Chester Cooper said the party notes that Moody's credit rating service has now downgraded the country's credit ratings several levels, firmly into junk territory. In fact, he said being downgraded two notches on the credit front and being given a negative outlook is really a triple whammy. Cooper said this is the second major ratings agency to downgrade the Bahamas this year after SNP pushed us further into junk territory. This is unfortunate for the country and for taxpayers who will now have to pay more for debt servicing, but it is not totally unexpected. He added that Moody's warned in April when the Bahamas was placed under review that it would be downgraded if they did not see a credible fiscal and economic policy response from the government. He said Moody's clearly did not, adding the latest budget did not inspire confidence here at home or in the world's financial markets. Cooper urged the government to assert the will to address some of the structural impediments to growth, inclusive of the cost of energy, the ease of doing business, and a more robust regime to encourage FDI and stimulate domestic investments. While well, Police Commissioner Paul Roll is defending the process behind investigating police-involved shootings. This after a noted attorney suggested an independent body be formed to investigate these incidents. Berthy McDermott reports. I don't know who that attorney is, but certainly he should know that there is an independent body in the coroner's court that is responsible for investigating all police uh, uh, shootings or killings. That was the police commissioner's response to attorney Wayne Monroe QC who charged that police involved shootings should be investigated by an independent body. According to rule in investigations, police simply assist with gathering evidence for the coroner. We in, in law enforcement, we assist the, the coroner in taking statements 
collecting evidence. When, when an officer collects, say for example, any evidence on that crime scene and he seals it there, he, he doesn't see that anymore until it gets in court. Persons who give police statements will appear before the coroner and the coroner is going to be doing the investigation and that is made up of members of the public. His comments come nearly two weeks after police shot and killed three men off Cowpen Road. At the time, Roll said the officers were ambushed. The incident prompted renewed calls for body cams to record officers' interaction with the public. During his address at the force's tactical defense graduation ceremony, Roll said the force has 800 cameras in country, adding that trainers will be coming into the country to train officers as soon as the country's borders reopen. We purchased the cameras from uh, company and they need to come and show us, uh, show the officers the correct way and use. Uh, so, I mean, that's any new technology. We're going to be doing training with the uh, drones as well as, as the uh, CCTV. So that's, that's a part of ongoing. We're going to be doing a whole lot of training. The police chief explains he is also exploring the idea of using non-lethal weapons like tasers. Well, it is depending on how soon the, the uh, vendors can get the information to me and then I have to then approach cabinet to you know and be doing the I'm, I'm not only trying to get them but you know I have to get feedback from the other professionals as well. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. Just two months after he predicted the unemployment rate would climb to about 30 percent, the acting labor director says he now expects it to surpass 40 percent in the short term due to redundancies in the tourism industry. The thing about the extended layoff period and even in some cases, determination. It may go higher than that for a short period of time, but I honestly believe by January, you'll start to see things pick up again. As Bahamar gets set to make 20% of its 6,000 member staff redundant, fears that other hotels will follow suit have become a reality. Tourism Minister Dionisio de Agler has predicted more hotel properties will carry out redundancy exercises as they seek to reduce their cost of doing business. Pinder says, unfortunately, it's not just the tourism industry. Because the whole world economy is mashed up. Everybody is basically on life support as it relates to trying to get their business up and running. So, no, for the most part, I'll say 80% of our businesses just struggling, hoping that uh, this thing will turn around. When he addressed Parliament on Monday, Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis said this is the first time in the country's history that the unemployment rate has hit between 30 to 40 percent. The acting Labor Director says he's banking on tourists still coming in this summer, despite some major resorts remaining closed and the eventual reopening of cruise ports. So between the ports now opening uh, by September, I'm hearing, the airports opening by August, July, um, we should start to see some business coming. Once business starts to come, hotels are able to receive bookings and um, be ready to welcome guests. Pinder says his office is inundated with calls and queries from eager job seekers. He said while there are little to no jobs available, there are some industries with a few openings. For the most part, a lot of construction is going on. People are still rebuilding from Hurricane Dorian. Um, and then as a result of, uh, of what's happening right now, people got to make adjustments to their properties with the social distancing and that sort of thing. So there's some, some construction going on. A full coroner's inquest is not necessary to provide closure for families of those reported missing in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, according to Attorney General Carl Bethel, who says a less tedious and much shorter route can be taken. Jasmine Brown reports. The Attorney General told senators that they've been working on that expedited process for months. In the days immediately following, we knew that this would be a problem. We had a meeting in my office with myself and the coroners and all the coroner's deputies who are present in New Providence. And we went through the law, and they, uh, they, were, they, were, they are aware of it, they agree, they in fact volunteer at this point, we explored it. It is possible to have an inquiry on an expedited basis without a full inquest jury. Bethel made the comments as he wrapped up the 2020-2021 budget debate in the Senate on Thursday evening. Dorian devastated parts of Abaco and Grand Bahama last September, leaving at least 74 dead and, according to the latest numbers from the Minister of National Security Marvin Dames, 279 missing. Many have raised concerns that relatives of the missing will have to wait years before their loved ones can be declared dead and their affairs sorted. But the AG insisted that does not have to be the case. The law admits of the ability to conduct a proper level of review 
of a missing person claim today already. Bethel further insisted it is possible to have an inquiry on an expedited basis without a full inquest jury, provided the death is not a suspicious death and not a police-involved shooting or in-custody death. You must have a full inquest for those. Other than that, the coroner is in, entitled to have a truncated inquiry. Okay, and this was explained by the coroner on the program that was on TV dealing with this issue of um, the, the bodies that were in Abaco and Grand Bahama. During his budget contribution, former Minister of Health Dr. Dwayne Sands said thousands of names of people reported missing immediately after Dorian were removed from the official list after police took responsibility for that aspect of the storm's aftermath. He insisted the government must apologize for the myriad of mistakes that were made. While Bethel shied away from the controversy, he did say this. Every unexpected death is deserving of investigation. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minister officially opened the Fishing Hole Road Causeway in Grand Bahama today. The causeway connects West and East Grand Bahama and is the main access route between West Grand Bahama communities and Freeport. However, flooding at the Fishing Hole Road has been a major issue. The original causeway was built in 1957. However, several hurricanes have resulted in large sections of the road being washed away. Today, I am pleased that residents now have a modern, designed, resilient concrete trestle bridge spanning 900 feet across the Hawksville Creek with a lifespan of 50 years, sitting 12 feet above the main sea level and able to withstand hurricanes up to Category 5 intensity. The causeway cost $9.2 million and was built by All Bahamas Construction. Minutes acknowledged several advocates who pushed for it to be built and thanked successive governments for their work towards completing the causeway. He also recognized the family of Bobby Tinker, who died during Hurricane Floyd. MP for Central Grand Bahama, Iram Lewis, says safety was priority when completing the project. If we allow you to go over this bridge and the safety mechanisms not in place, one life lost was too many and you will never forgive us for being reckless. So on your behalf, we took our time to ensure that the lines were properly in, the reflectors are in, the guardrails are in, the lights are in. As we open this causeway, if we need to put additional safety mechanism in, like safety rumble strips, we will put those in to ensure that we do not lose any life. Still to come, immigration's warning of fake marriages. Stay tuned. You're watching Our News. Welcome back. Police Commissioner Paul Roll admitting that in recent weeks there has been an increase in armed robberies. However, he said it's a matter of police are on top of noting that there has also been an increase in the arrests of the armed robbery suspects. You would have noticed uh, that there was also an, an increase in arrest for armed robberies since last week, eh? Yeah, even up to last night. We've been intercepting. That's the effectiveness of these training. So there has been an increase, and there's also been an increase in apprehensions immediately or uh, within minutes. In the past two weeks, police have reported seven armed robberies. And as COVID-19 restrictions are eased, Roll says the force has a plan. We have a plan for every day. We have a plan for every day. And of course, when the, the curfew is, yes, the short of it is, we do. Immigration Director Clarence Russell sending a stern warning to anyone thinking about entering false marriages and forging documents in an effort to gain Bahamian citizenship. Cease forthwith. And if you do not cease forthwith, you will be found, you will be identified, you will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Russell also addressed the ongoing challenge of illegal migration. He said there has been an increase in manpower. 
What I will say is that there is an increase of vigilance. There is an increase of manpower in the area. There is an increase of sensitivity to exactly what they are doing. Hence, you now see persons being placed before the court. That is a result of vigilance and increased law enforcement. Still to come, C.R. Walker celebrates the class of 2020. Stay tuned. Welcome back to our news. Under the theme, Climbing Higher, the journey to excellence continues. C.R. Walker Senior High's class of 2020 made history Thursday in the school's first drive through graduation ceremony. George Bain was there and has more. Over 100 C.R. Walker Knights graduating in style today with banners and balloons floating. They're taking place in the school's first drive through graduation ceremony. The graduation ceremony left parts of Blue Hill Road and East Street completely shut down as parents, graduates and supporters lined the school's fence to show support to over 212 graders who were recognized by the school Thursday morning. Parents showed their creative side, decorating cars with balloons, banners, and photos of the seniors. COVID-19 has changed the face of the world forever, and the world now has to live with the new normal. Class of 2020, you are history in the making. Whether you are college-bound or headed into the workforce, the use of technology is critical. You must adjust to it, get with it, or the world will leave you behind. St. Barnabas MP Shannon Dawn Cartwright told students that as they leave the halls of high school, they must remember all the important lessons that they've learned in and out of the classroom. You will not be remembered in this life for the distinctions before and after your name. You will only be remembered how you changed the lives of others and changed your country. So today, yes, this is about you and your achievements. But use your achievements to change your community, to change your country, and affect the lives of your fellow behaviors. After the speeches, it was time for the students to shine. Waiting in line for her turn to walk across the stage, we spoke with Courtney Cash, who applauded the school for making her graduation class feel special. It's something, something is better than nothing. I prefer to still be able to have my moment and walk across the carpet and get my diploma instead of having a virtual graduation. I feel as though that they show that they still care about the students by having a drive through graduation. This graduate said that after 12 long years in school, he is happy to have made it to the finish line. I feel excited to finally finish, to be honest. It was very hard, you know, challenging, but be pulled through. Graduating with honors, Dominique Bowleg has plans to head to the island school in Eleuthera now that high school is done. It feels really great because like this is like a type of graduation no one has ever had before so it's really great to say that I was the first one to have this type of graduation and I really hope this becomes a trend with new graduations. Reporting for our news, I'm Georgie O'Bain. Right, thanks, Giorgio. Still to come, a valedictorian graduates one month after his mom's untimely death. Stay tuned.
Finally tonight in our news, a 17-year-old high school valedictorian is optimistic about his future despite losing his mother just one month before graduation. Jared Higgs has his story. 17-year-old Garvin Bullard says these are just a few of the trophies he has won for academics and music during his school career. Once or twice I had the highest GPA of the school and we also was rewarded for that as well. We got a, an additional trophy for having the highest um, GPA of the school. Bullard was the head boy at T.A. Thompson three years ago, a feat he repeated at C.C. Sweeting this past school year. He was a valedictorian of his graduating class, and it's no wonder he's so proud of the institution. Some people may be like, hey, um, C.C. Sweeting has this stigma attached to it, but hey, we have other things um, fantastic going on there as well. Bullard applied to and was accepted into several colleges in the United States. He wants to attend Middle Tennessee State University where his 20-year-old sister is currently a student. But the teenager's life took a cruel turn in May when his mother, 45-year-old Cindy Bullard, lost a short battle with breast cancer. My mom and I, we had a really close relationship. Her death shocked the teenager and sent him into a depression. Her passing comes six years after the boy's father died from a respiratory illness. And you know he did an excellent job in terms of raising me while he did. When we spoke to Bullard at his Jubilee Gardens home, he appeared in much better spirits and says he is starting to regain focus. He fondly remembers the bond he shared with his mom. We did a talk, sit down, she encouraged me, I listened to her, hear how her day is going. And we normally would just inspire each other. Bullard says despite financial challenges and, of course, the pandemic, he's optimistic that he will find his way to university abroad in the fall. He's waiting to hear back from schools about financial aid. I applied for scholarships. I applied for um, the public school scholarship. This is the government scholarship that is granted to government school students. The 17-year-old says he wants to make his parents proud. Whatever the future holds for him, he says he lives by this mantra. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. Thank you for joining us for Our News tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Remember, you can catch Our News on the Gold Rebel Go Play app. Have a good Friday evening, Bahamas.